want to thank all of you for coming again to our celebration of doing things live again, or at least in hybrid format. Um, we have an amazing liver session um, with Drs. Harrison and Mufti and Rich and Gonzalez. Uh, and two amazing moderators, and Dr. Jalan and uh, Dr. Uh, Casey, who will guide us uh, with a really, for as much as you can do in an hour and 20 minutes, a really comprehensive talk of the relevant areas of our practices in hepatology. So I will leave it to Prashun and Lisa. Thank you. Uh, so the next hour and a half, we'll be talking about liver uh, on Sunday morning. And thank you for all <laughs> coming. Um, and um, as you know, that our first speaker is Dr. Stephen Harrison. He is a well-known expert in the field of fatty liver disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. He uh, was a colonel in, in, in the armed forces. Now he's all over the world, including visiting faculty at Oxford. And every year he gives us, we need to know what is going on in that field and he updates us. And He's the best person to talk to us because he has published everywhere. And with that, Dr. Harrison, please. All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you guys for the wonderful introduction. Thanks, Chuck, as well. It's great to see many of you here, old friends, colleagues, and it's good to be back speaking at the TSG on a Sunday morning. I know this is uh, grab your coffee, get your liver learn on on a Sunday morning. So I promise you, I'm not going to put you to sleep. You're going to you're going to be glad you showed up for this. Uh, I hope so by the end of it. And, you know, one of the things I always like to tell my <clears throat> my colleagues and then when I was at Brook Army, when I trained fellows was, you know, three questions. What? So what? Now what? And I hope by the end of this talk, you realize that the, the now what is here today, and we'll talk about the what and the so what as we go through. All right, there we go. So my disclosures, uh, essentially I work with pretty much every company that is developing drugs in the field. So I'm so conflicted, I'm really not conflicted. All right, just to set the stage, for NASH. Everybody knows this was really an umbrella term. It encompasses the spectrum from a little fat in your liver. We call that isolated steatosis all the way through to cirrhosis liver cancer. And you see the comorbidities listed here. This is essentially a disease of affluence, if you will, with some genetic overlay, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, hypertension is intri intricately involved. And just want to talk a minute about the what and the so what. So there was a recent paper, and you see some of the data in the bottom left of this, published by Estes, Lumba, Sanyal, and Hepatology, looking at modeling. What happens with fatty liver between 2015 and 2030? And we're 2021, so we're six years into this modeling. It was predicted that NASH would lead to decompensated cirrhosis increase of 168% by 2030. Hepatocellular carcinoma would rise 137%. Liver-related death would go up 178%. And between 2015 and 2030, 800,000, 800,000 800, excess liver deaths. Put that in perspective, COVID has killed, as of this morning, 688,000 Americans, COVID. We've made such a big deal about COVID, more people are projected to die from NASH cirrhosis than COVID. So the attention we need to put to that is, is clear. And this is really a result, as I mentioned before, a disease of affluence. And we see diabetes trends and obesity trends continuing to climb. We have not plateaued yet in either of those. As long as these two are increasing, NASH will continue to increase as well. And you might say to yourself, self, I don't, I don't deal with a lot of that. Well, if you see patients in the state of Texas, I guarantee you, you see NASH. And why do I know that? Because just down the road in San Antonio, here are two papers I published over the past decade, looking at about a thousand patients that presented for colon cancer screening 
and thought that their livers were completely normal and healthy. And when put to the test, about a third of them were found to have fatty liver. And when we stick a needle in their liver, what you see back in 2007 to 2010, about 12% had NASH. When we looked at them again from 2015 to 2018, it was about the same, 14%, which means roughly one in eight of your patients that you see over the age of 50 presenting for routine colon cancer screening, now 45, will have NASH. And you might say, well, what does that mean? How big a deal is that? Well, look at the blue bar. So back in 2007 to 2010, only about 2.7% of patients that walked into your clinic for routine colon cancer screening had advanced liver disease. Now keep in mind, these people thought their livers were completely healthy. We double that over an eight year time period, suggesting that the modeling that Estes did in 2015 is actually spot on and we will see these numbers matriculate through 2030. Diving into this study a little bit more, what you see in the green bar is MRI PDFF liver fat content. This is NAFLD. 38% of people over the age of 50 in San Antonio have fatty liver disease. 14% in the blue have NASH. But look at the demographics here. Anybody here see diabetics? Anybody scope diabetic patients? Yeah, 70% of them have fatty liver and a third have NASH. You ever see a diabetic that's overweight or hypertensive? 74% of them have fat, almost half have NASH. So every single person in this room sees these patients. So what can we do about them? And I have to show this here because lifestyle recommendation remains the foundational way that we manage these patients but very clearly it has to be a change in the patient's mentality or they won't undergo the lifestyle recommendations they need. The quote I use with my patients is, heart transformation leads to behavioral modification. If you're not changing your heart, you're not changing your attitude and that's anything in life, but it really applies to your health. When they undergo that heart transformation and are willing to have behavioral modification, it starts with diet. You can look at caloric restriction. You can cut them back by 750 to 1,000 a day. You can try the new novel intermittent fasting approach, which is essentially 18 hours without eating. You eat from you know, 12 in the afternoon to six at night, and then you fast till noon the next day. That works for several people that still wanna eat their carbs. If you don't want to do that, then you have to eliminate the bread, rice, pasta, pizza, potatoes, french fries, and tortillas. And you can't fight with your patient about, you know, is a corn tortilla different than a flour tortilla? Because the answer is it still ends in tortilla. So no, you don't have that prerogative. So you could do that as well. And, and those really are foundational components of this, cutting out sodas, fructose containing beverages. People forget that orange juice has lots of sugar in it. That's another big one to cut out. Um, and then the goal of all this is to lose weight. How much weight? Ideally 10% weight, at least 7%. So the good news story there is if you see a patient tomorrow in clinic that's 250 pounds, they don't have to lose 80. They just need to lose 25 and they actually will make their liver better. Exercise. Exercise alone will not lose weight, but you might get rid of some of the fat in the liver. Fat fluxes very quickly in and out of liver. If you look at bariatric surgery, they often put patients on a very tight restricted diet and over two weeks of, of time, they can actually shrink the liver significantly so they can get in there and do the, and do the bypass. <clears throat> but ideally you wanna marry aerobic and anaerobic exercise with a weight loss, with a, with a diet strategy. And if you want to be scientific about it, you want to get on the treadmill and burn all the glycogen first, and then you wanna go lift weights, because then you're burning fat. But the, the key is to just get in the gym and do both. Or if your patients are uh, sed 
you know, they basically just sit around the couch and, and don't do anything. The first thing they need to just do is get up and walk. And we use the 5,000 steps, then we try to get to 7,500, then we try to get to 10,000 steps a day. But ideally, they should be doing some sort of weight training, you know, little two pound weights in their arms or whatever, or something as simple as just sitting, standing from a sitting position without using your hands. Try that when you get up today. If you tell your patients, particularly your elderly patients, to do that, 10 times, three times a day, they'll help build their quad strength and balance. We talk about that in our cirrhotic sarcopenic patients all the time. And then the, there's a new paradigm with alcohol. I mean, we get asked this all the time, is any alcohol okay? If so, how much? The bottom line is it's better to not have any alcohol uh, because if you allow them to have one glass of wine, it becomes two, two becomes three, more on the weekends, and it's hard to rein that in. So just moving quickly forward to bariatric surgery. Look, bariatric surgery is great in the right clinical setting. It's not a cure for obesity. It's not a cure for NASH in this country. But in select cases, it will make a difference. And you see that here. The first pie graph on the left <clears throat> shows mild NASH in, in red, kind of moderate NASH in blue, and pretty severe NASH in that little grayish part of the pie. And then post-surgery, one year later, you see the majority have no NASH, and five years later, it's sustained. And, and so it does have a role to play. But what about looking at the guidance document? What, is, what, are, what are our colleagues saying relative to who we should treat? Well, we have the European guidelines, we have the American guidelines, and we have the Asian guidelines. And I help write the American guidelines. It's currently under a rewrite now. So this is a bit old. It was written in 17, published in 18. But if we look on the left, pharmacologic therapy should be reserved for patients with NASH with F2 disease or higher, and patients with less severe disease but at high risk of progression, like diabetics, could be candidates. In the U.S., we say pharmacologic treatment should be limited to those with biopsy-proven NASH and fibrosis. And then the easel recommendations say more evidence is needed. When we look at pharmacotherapy, what's out there? There's pioglitazone and there's vitamin E, essentially. In the U.S., we say pioglitazone to treat patients with biopsy-proven NASH. Consider vitamin E for biopsy-proven NASH in non-diabetics, but not in diabetics with fatty liver without a biopsy. And it's premature to consider GLP-1 agonists to treat NASH, and SGLT2 inhibitors are not included in these guidance. So that's the party line, but let me just put a little Harrison swag to that. The reality is you need to be using this therapy if you're not putting them in clinical trials. And we have tons of clinical trials we'll talk about in a minute. But I use pioglitazone, start at 15, increase to 30, don't usually go to 45 because I don't want the weight gain, the water weight gain that comes with PPAR gamma agonism. But I'll show you in a minute, it's pretty provocative, the data around pioglitazone. And vitamin E, I use that too. The dose needs to be 1,000 international units a day, and ideally it needs to be naturally occurring RRR alpha tocopherol, not just vitamin E you pick up at HEB or Kroger or wherever. All right, but there is a caveat about using these in cirrhotic patients. I just say, be careful. Don't use it in a decompensated patient. If you're a well-compensated child's A cirrhotic patient, I think either of these would be okay. And same thing for GLP-1 agonists. Now, we're not going to really prescribe GLP-1 agonists, but your patients may come to you on it. In fact, our, our studies suggest that about 25% of patients we see with NASH are already on a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGLT2 inhibitor. And that's okay. That's okay because the data suggests they reduce CV events in the long term, and that remains the number one killer of a NASH patient. There is this comment about silymarin. Uh, you know, I, I, there is no data to recommend that in our patients. So please, if patients are asking about this, tell them to spend their money elsewhere, maybe on vitamin E. So here's the data. It comes from the Pivens trial published in New England Journal in 2010. Just look all the way over on the right. You see pioglitazone in blue, teal color is uh, vitamin E, and then the green is placebo. And you see they're both significantly better than placebo at resolution of NASH. And there's been significant data come out in, come, coming out since then to support that. But where are we 
moving? Where is the field moving? The NASH field is moving rapidly toward our first FDA approved therapy. And it's targeting a surrogate outcome because it takes about 20 years on average for a patient to progress from mild NASH to decompensating disease. And if the FDA said, we have to do a 20 year trial, well, we would never have therapy for NASH. So instead they have this thing called subpart H approval where they say, if you can show us that in this field, you resolve NASH or you improve fibrosis, we will grant you conditional approval to sell your drug at CVS, Walgreens or wherever. But you still have to continue the trial and show that in fact there is an outcome measure that is predicted by giving therapy, that you're actually changing how a patient feels, functions or survives. So where do we get this data? Well, this data, quite frankly, comes from some data presented by the NASH CRN. So this is a, a consortium of people put together by the NIH to focus on NASH. And here are the two endpoints. We can resolve NASH histopathologically, meaning we need a liver biopsy to show essentially no ballooning degeneration of hepatocytes without worsening of fibrosis. Interestingly, don't care about how much fat you lose. It's just ballooning and inflammation needs to get better. And then the other option is we make fibrosis better without worsening of NASH. So where did that data come from? Well, it came from here, at least on the fibrosis side, and there have been at least five meta-analyses that have looked at this. I made this comment here before, I've never meta-analysis that I liked. However, there is data that can be compelling when we look at it, and we see that here. In severe liver disease, we see that the hazard ratio versus controls is 14 for an F3 and 104 for an F4 patient. So clearly those patients are at increased risk. But what about liver-related mortality? It starts at F2, actually. So this is why we enroll F2 patients with NASH in clinical trials. Now, you might say to yourself, Self, well, what if we make fibrosis better? Is there any data to suggest that has an outcome benefit? And that comes from data on this slide and work we did with Gilead on what's called the Stellar 4 and Simtuzumab trials, which were cirrhotic studies. We enrolled about 11,000 patients and looked at them over a one to two year period of time, repeated liver biopsies in those patients and actually showed that if you improve fibrosis, they had better outcomes. So there is now data to support that. But what about NASH? What if we make NASH better? Does that relate to a better outcome? We don't know. But what we do know is if you make NASH better, fibrosis gets better. And if you can connect the dots back to the slide I showed you a minute ago, if you make fibrosis better, you have a better outcome. And that's illustrated here again. You probably have heard of something called the NAFLD activity score. This is a combination of steatosis quantification inflammation quantification and ballooning degeneration quantification. And you can see on the graph on the left that as you improve NAS, that means you go to a negative number, that on the vertical axis, fibrosis also improves. And if you don't like that graph, look at the one on the right, the bar graph illustrates it as well. If you go from the first biopsy showing NASH and the one on the right is the last biopsy showing NAFLD and just look at that kind of washed out red color at the bottom, it significantly increases, basically showing that as you go from NASH to no NASH, fibrosis significantly improves. So with that in mind, and we have that as our foundation of how to develop a drug for NASH, that, that's myopic, right? It's like staring at a sequoia tree right in front of the tree and feeling it and trying to figure out what it is. We wanna really step back from the tree elevate to 30,000 feet and realize that there's a forest before us. And so given that, shouldn't we have drugs that reduce the lipotoxic fat that's driving all of this? Remember, the liver just wants to heal. It wants to regenerate just like the skin does. You injure the liver, the liver says, I need to lay down a scab to fix what's injured, to build a framework of collagen that allows new hepatocytes to grow, proliferate, and then if the injury is taken away, the fibrosis or the scab gets reabsorbed. It can't fall off, so it's got to be reabsorbed. But paradoxically, if you continually injure the liver over two decades, what happens is the scar accumulates ultimately enough 
is there to lead to what we call cirrhosis. And then it begins to lead to dysfunction of the liver and then decompensation. So if fat is the driver of NASH and all the bad things that happen, get rid of the fat. We suppress the B, we cure the C, we treat the autoimmune and it works. So we should be able to get rid of the fat in this situation and work and it should work as well. So what about weight loss? That's important for, for patients with this disease. Atherogenic lipid improvement would, would be nice as well. And then glycemic control. Shouldn't we have a drug that gets after all of that? And is there a single therapy that can do it? And the answer today is no, but we do have drugs in the pipeline that are targeting this. And this is what I want to spend the rest of my talk on. So here are potential therapeutic targets. We can get after the liver, the fat that's coming into the liver. Where does it come from? It comes from sick adipocytes that are in your, in your muscle, that are in the subcutaneous fat, that are in visceral fat. Remember, visceral fat is the bad fat. So we want to try to reduce that as well as reduce the fatty acids that are coming out of that and going to the liver. So we have lots of drugs that can do that. That's targeting this green part, the metabolic part. We can also work inside the liver to make mitochondria healthy again. If we can make mitochondria healthy again, we can burn fat through beta oxidation. And drugs like thyroid hormone receptor beta agonist, resmeterone, doing that. And that's currently in phase three right now. Their trial has fully enrolled. We anticipate that study to be done in June of next year. What happens at that point is they put all the data together. They submit a new drug application to the FDA. We wait six months for the interpretation of the FDA. So just reading the tea leaves, if the study finishes in June of next year, it'll be June of the year after when there should be an opinion by the FDA. <clears throat> So in theory, we should potentially have our first FDA approved drug no later than June, July of 2023. Having said that, there is a drug that has gone forward to the FDA already. That's an FXR agonist. You see that also drugs listed here. That's down in the, uh, the pink color on the, the bottom left. And that works by uh, uh, modulating bile acids. And we know bile acids have a lot of activity on stellate cells within the liver. That drug was submitted to the FDA already a while back, and unfortunately, the FDA said no. The risk-benefit ratio was not worthy of being approved. In that trial, fibrosis benefit was 11% over placebo, but there was issues with raising LDL cholesterol. We know these people die of heart attacks and strokes, so maybe not the best thing to do. And also itching or pruritus was a problem. Since that time, they've accumulated an additional 500 patients or so worth of data, and they've had a longer runway to follow patients for safety, and they have announced that they should be submitting a new drug application in the first quarter of 2022, and again, six months from there for approval. So there potentially will be a drug approved for NASH in Q2, Q3 of next year, but I think if it does get approved, it'll be in a finite population with very stringent left and right boundaries around following them. So. There might be drug approved in next, next year, but ideally 2023. So having said that, there's lots of different targets here. We could target different buckets of insulin resistance, lipotoxic oxidative stress, inflammation, cell death, and fibrosis, but you see the majority of them are on the left. Why? The higher up in this spectrum we are able to target, the better we have downstream effects. If we go laser targeted on a very specific pathway, the, uh, the, the liver is very good at finding redundant ways to get around that blockage. If you go way up high in the pathway, such as modulating fat from coming into the liver, then you prevent all of those downstream targets from being affected. So that's the goal. So here's our pipeline, lots and lots of drugs coming to the top. Unfortunately, the funnel gets very tight at the bottom. So we have more to come there. And prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. You've seen this gentleman say that, Yogi Berra has said that, but I wanna make a, an astute prediction and I'm a football fan. So I'm also an Ole Miss alumni. And so Ole Miss plays Alabama next Saturday. This will be the number one team against probably number 10 or 11 for Ole Miss. And I'm making a prediction about the future today that Ole Miss will beat Alabama next weekend. Any Alabama fans out here? 
Ah, there you go. Well, hotty toddy. Okay, so there are multiple agents in development. We can break these down into oral agents and injectables or infusions. And you see the oral agents listed on the left. There are over 10 or 15 of them currently in development. And we see injectables on the right. We have this thing called FGF-19 agonist. We have FGF-21 agonist. We have semaglutide, that's a GLP-1 receptor agonist. We have combinations to help lose weight of GLP-1 and glucagon agonist and GLP-1 GIPs and then galactin inhibitors. All of them have very similar profiles in that they're injectable and they carry GI tolerability effects, side effects. So first about injections. I think they're very potent on histopathology. We don't know about GLP-1 receptor agonists like semaglutide, but on, on fibrosis, it does work very well on NASH. That paper was recently published in New England Journal of Medicine. And we think it may have a big impact on metabolic profiles. We, we know we wanna get after glycemic control, atherogenic lipids, liver fat reduction, in addition to histopathology, but we have this issue with GI tolerability. So in my mind, these agents are going to be used as induction agents to reduce an F3, F4 well compensated cirrhotic, and then bring them back to something where we can treat them for the long term. Remember, these patients don't generally have symptoms, so if we're giving them symptoms, the juice better be worth the squeeze. So we would use it short term to bring them back from the edge and then transition them over to an oral agent. These oral agents, we think, maybe aren't quite as potent on histopathology, but they might be better tolerated. In fact, they probably are better tolerated, and they make it easier to begin to put different drugs together in what we call fixed dose combinations, because it's hard to put an injectable with an oral in one modality, right? You're either taking a pill and then giving a shot, or it's just complicated. So if we could just put two mechanisms of action together in one pill, that would be better. And so here, I think doing that, we're able to get after all of this pyramid. Oral agents for long-term maintenance, mainly in F1 and F2 patients, injection therapy, bringing the patients back from the edge and then transitioning them to an oral agent. And I tried to summarize this for you here. This is my perspective as we come to an end. And I just wanna walk through three components of drug development. One, we have to give a drug to patients that, that doesn't increase side effect profiles. We want to be giving them a drug, it's like taking a vitamin. They take it, they don't really have any bad effects, but it's working positively on their liver. And it's also working on extra hepatic manifestations of this disease like glycemic control, atherogenic lipids, and weight. So on the vertical axis, we see extra hepatic effects. The higher you go up in, in this graph, the better it is on glycemic control, atherogenic lipids, and that sort of thing. As we go from left to right, that's histologic effect left being no impact to the right, the biggest impact, and then the side effect profile. Now it's interesting in drug development, you very rarely have reports in literature of severe side effects. Everybody wants to say, oh, they were mainly mild or moderate, but we know many of them are moderate to maybe a little bit worse than that. And I've given that the blue square. Green is mild. So you really want to have a green square next to your name and you want to be in the upper right hand corner way up here. Well, I don't, I'm not sure this, uh, I don't have a highlighter, but um, you want to be in the upper right hand quadrant. What is doing that in non serotic NASH you see on the left Ifruxafermin and semaglutide are the best we have right now, but they also have quite a number of side effects. All right, so what's one that doesn't have a lot of side effects? Let's go to resmeterone. That's the thyroid hormone receptor beta drug in the square center. It doesn't quite have the impact on glycemic control and weight that the other two above it do. It is impacting atherogenic lipids, however. And if you look at how well it's affecting the liver, it's not too far behind semaglutide and afruxafermin. If we look over on the cirrhotic side, we have less drugs right now reporting out in cirrhosis, but this is a big push now to focus on cirrhotic patients with NASH. And we see afruxafermin is the closest thing we have right now. How close? I just published some data or presented data, it hasn't been published yet, in a cohort of NASH well-compensated cirrhotic patients treated with 16 weeks of therapy with this 
with this injectable. It's an FGF21 analog. It reduces liver fat significantly, but in one third of patients, it pulled these cirrhotic patients back from cirrhosis to F3 disease in as short as 16 weeks of therapy. So stay tuned. This class of drug is now being studied very, uh, very rigidly in a NASH population. So my final slide is on combination therapy, and this is absolutely where we are going to go. Uh, it's a little bit like the Wright bro brothers in flying an airplane. The first thing they had to do was just prove that you could fly. It didn't matter how ugly it was or how fast it went, but it just got off the ground and it, it flew. That's where we are right now with drug development in NASH. We are finding drugs that can get us that first biplane. We're taken off. But we're not at the F-35, F-22, fifth generation strike fighter yet. That's yet to come. In a couple years, I'll be back hopefully here giving you that answer. And that will be in the form of combination therapy. So on patients without cirrhosis, we're going to target that liver fat. Let's get the fat out of the liver and let the liver heal itself. And fibrosis, we will resolve eventually. On the other hand, if you've got an F3 or a well-compensated F4 patient, we need to shut down the fibrotic component, shut down the stellate cells. And that's where we need to focus our efforts. It doesn't mean we don't focus on metabolism, but it's not our primary focus. So you'll see drugs being developed with kind of two different paradigms, those for cirrhotics and those without cirrhosis. And with that, I would say thank you for your attention, and I'll be around for the q and I guess, in a bit. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. That's a wonderful lecture from the real expert with that forefront of research. Um, we'll take questions at the end. With that, it's my privilege and honor to pass the microphone to um, Dr. Lisa Casey, who is the course director and our co-moderator. And he, she is from UT Southwestern faculty. Thank you. Uh, well, co-course director with Dr. Owen. So we're pleased to welcome R.G. Mufti. He comes from UT Southwestern here locally via London, Michigan, Chicago. One of my colleagues for eight years. Um, he currently is the medical director for the Living Related Donor Transplant Program at UT Southwestern and also our Gastroenterology Fellowship Program Director. And he's going to speak to us about um, managing complications of portal hypertension. Perfect. Thanks, Lisa. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. Dr. Harrison will be a hard act to follow. Um, I'm going to try and get through management of portal hypertensive complications in about 20 minutes, which is a relatively tall order. Um, and because this is a mixed audience, um, if some of these concepts seem basic at times, please forgive me, but uh, we're catering to some of the fellows here as well. So with that, we'll get started. And really, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about what is portal hypertension, the classification of portal hypertension, some of the complications, and what we do to manage uh, the consequences of portal hypertension as well. And so really, we'll start off with the anatomy of the portal circulation, because if you understand this, then you really understand what the complications are. And portal hypertension can mean lots of different things. When we talk about it here today, we'll be really talking about sinusoidal portal hypertension, and what are the hepatic sinusoids. They're really the capillaries of the liver, and the liver has a, a unique blood supply because it has a dual organ blood supply with the hepatic vein, um, uh, hepatic artery, I beg your pardon, and the portal vein as well. And so with that, when we typically talk about portal hypertension, we're talking about sinusoidal portal hypertension. But as you can see with the portal circulation, you can have prehepatic portal hypertension if you had portal vein thrombosis because the pressures between the spleen and the liver are elevated. So it's really important when we talk about portal hypertension that we're really precise uh, about what type of portal hypertension we're talking about. So how do we define portal hypertension? It's really with the hepatic venous pressure gradient. And what we measure is the, uh, the wedge hepatic uh, vein pressure uh, and subtract it from the free hepatic vein pressure. And what the wedge hepatic vein pressure is really a, a surrogate of your sinusoidal pressure. And if your gradient is under five, it's normal. If it's between five and 10, it's mild portal hypertension. If it's greater than 10, you have clinically significant portal hypertension and greater than 12, you're at risk of variceal hemorrhage. And then 16 and then 20, you have increased complications and mortality as well. So when we think about classifications, as I said, it's really important to be precise. And so 
we can classify it as prehepatic, intrahepatic, and posthepatic, and then look at the vessels involved. So whether it's the large portal veins, if you have portal vein thrombosis, that's prehepatic. Um, if you have cirrhosis with sinusoidal involvement, that's sinusoidal portal hypertension, that's intrahepatic. And then we've seen patients with Bud Chiari, for example, with hepatic vein involvement, and uh, that would be uh, posthepatic and postsinusoidal. And so we can come up with etiologies. And the reason this is important is when we're looking at portal pressure measurements, you can have a normal hepatic venous pressure gradient and still have portal hypertension. And this is one of the things that we a concept we're always trying to pass on to the fellows. So if you have, for example, at the top there, prehepatic portal hypertension with portal vein thrombosis, your wedge hepatic pressure will be normal, your free hepatic pressure will be normal, and if you measure your hepatic venous pressure gradient, that's also normal, but you have portal hypertension. And so the idea when we talk about portal hypertension to the here today, I'll really be talking about hepatic or sinusoidal portal hypertension. So really when we see in patients uh, with cirrhosis, where the wedge pressure is increased, the free hepatic should be normal, and then your hepatic venous pressure gradient uh, will be uh, increased um, as well. And so what do we think about what happens in patients with portal hyper in, uh, in cirrhosis or decompensated cirrhosis that results in some of these uh, uh, manifestations that we'll be talking about today with complications of portal hypertension? Well, we have um, physiologic changes that take place with a, a decrease um, in systemic vascular resistance. You get splanchic vasodilation as well, and eventually you get the development of portal hypertension. With that, there's increased bacterial translocation. You've got pathogen-associated molecular patterns, um, increase of those damage-associated molecular patterns, and innate receptors, um, uh, pattern recognition patterns are, are activated. And eventually, you get release of these pleuroinflammatory uh, molecules, and the end product of that is that you can get complications that we see. So specifically, we'll be talking about ascites, we'll be talking about hepatic encephalopathy. Uh, I will not touch on kidney dysfunction, and we won't talk about uh, adrenal insufficiency. This is important because when we think about patients with poor liver disease, we're really considering them on a spectrum. We're really taking them from someone with minimal fibrosis, moderate fibrosis, cirrhosis, and then decompensate cirrhosis. And this matters because their outcomes are very, very different. So when we see, obviously, and you see patients, what we always want to know is where are they on that spectrum because it helps to predict how they will do in the future and how, what we, how we manage them in the future as well. And so if you're an asymptomatic compensated cirrhotic, your median survival is 10 years, so 12 years, so you still do well. But as soon as you have decompensated cirrhosis, um, and you're symptomatic, the median survival dramatically shortens to two years. And as we talk about some of these complications, we'll touch on these further. And so what we think about, and this is uh, Dr. Garcia Sao has published a lot of this data, is we think about patients with no cirrhosis, compensated cirrhosis, and I said decompensated cirrhosis, and we really think about this, com uh, this concept of clinically significant portal hypertension. So you have complicated cirrhosis if you don't have ascites, if you've never had a hemorrhage, if you don't have encephalopathy. As soon as you develop any of those, you have decompensated cirrhosis. And the hepatic venous pressure gradient is a surrogate that we can use that will tell us about what stage of disease these patients may be in. So just to take an example, if you have any of the complications of uh, cirrhosis, i.e. decompensated cirrhosis, by definition, you have clinically significant portal hypertension. Whereas um, if you have a, a gradient of between 5 and 10, you have compensated cirrhosis, but you're not in the realm of uh, clinically significant portal hypertension yet. And the other thing I would point to is the liver stiffness measurements on this graph, because on this table, because they're increasingly important. We use surrogate markers of portal hypertension in, in clinical practice now. Um, where we use fibro scan, where we use ultrasound elastography, MR as well now, um, as well as fibro or other uh, blood test markers as well. And the important part is we look at the liver stiffness, uh, because if the if the liver stiffness is between 10 and 20, it's a gray zone. If you're above 20, uh, you are essentially have clinically significant portal hypertension, um, and that matters when we think about how we screen uh, these patients, um, and we combine that, that with the platelet count, which I'll talk about. So ascites is the most common complication um, in patients um, that we see, develops in about 5 to 10% of patients per year, and it has a huge impact, as uh, we're all familiar with, 
with lots of hospitalizations, um, impairs working life, social life, and has a poor prognosis um, in, this, in this patient population as well. And when we classify ascites as grade one, grade two, or grade three, really we tend to see patients with grade two and grade three ascites because that's when they have moderate or, or more severe ascites. Um, and uh, we classify recurrent ascites as if you have more than three occasions within a 12 month period where you're compliant, you have diuretic control, but you continue to get it. And in our population in the US um, and in the West, cirrhosis is responsible for 80% of patients with ascites. And we're all familiar with this initial patient evaluation, they get an ultrasound, we, uh, di we look at the acidic fluid um, and we do an assessment. The reason we look at the acidic fluid is we want to make sure that they don't have an infection. And then if there's any doubt about the etiology of the ascites, the acidic fluid can give us a lot of information. And the other thing, I put this at the bottom, we did, a, uh, this often comes up even now in our hospital. Uh, there is no indication for blood products when you're doing a diagnostic paracentesis. It really should not be a barrier. Nothing should really stop these patients from getting a diagnostic paracentesis. And we're all familiar with this. We look at the neutrophil count um, when we culture the acidic fluid, and uh, you also uh, look at the total protein. Um, and uh, look at the albumin. And the idea is to calculate the serum ascites um, um, albumin gradient. And this is a, a table um, that I, I put here for ease. And really, when we look at patients with cirrhosis, we're looking at patients with high SAG ascites, so greater than or equal to 1.1 1 .1, uh, with low protein. The reason that fluid content becomes, the composition of that fluid becomes important is obviously, for example, uh, in patients with heart failure, um, they may have high protein ascites, so the amount of protein is higher than we typically see in our cirrhotic patients. Now, this is not a perfect um, um, correlation, obviously, and we have lots of um, data to back, uh, back this up, but I, in the interest of time, I won't go through that today. Okay, so what do we do um, with uh, new onset ascites? So a diagnostic paracentesis in these patients, we get the um, serum albumin uh, and uh, uh, acidic fluid albumin. We look at the acidic fluid protein and then classify these patients. So for example, on the very, uh, as you're looking at it, on the left-hand side, patients with cirrhosis, high, high SAG, low protein ascites with cirrhosis, confirming that with other, imaging, et cetera, patient, um, uh, the patient that's in front of you, um, and then uh, you go on from there. Whereas if, for example, the protein levels are higher, then you would be thinking about post-sinusoidal causes uh, uh, of uh, ascites as well. And if it's less than 1.1, uh, less than, uh, then you're really looking at other causes such as peritoneal disease, um, you know, metastatic disease, TB, et cetera. And so this is really, really important because um, Ascites confers portends a really poor prognosis in our patients. So this is what I mean when I say we really look at the spectrum uh, of, of where our patients are. So if you have a compensated cirrhotic, their median survival is 12 years. As soon as you have someone who's decompensated with ascites, the one-year mortality, depending on uh, is up to 40% per year, and the two-year mortality is 50%. And so these are patients where we should be thinking about referral to transplantation uh, early. And I think I just added this, but everyone is familiar with this. Uh, uh, First-line therapy is mineral corticoids, so spironolactone, for example, and then loop diuretics such as Lasix. We restrict the sodium and we look for electrolyte abnormalities. And when we think about weight loss, obviously, um, we're really trying to get about half a kilogram per day in patients without edema and about a kilogram per day, if possible, in patients with edema. And when we do LVPs, um, should be performed with an albumin infusion, uh, uh, infusion eight grams per Liter, and we avoid uh, uh, nephrotoxic agents, non steroidals, um, um, ACE inhibitors, ARBs. And then we have this, the patients who present with refractory ascites. So when we think about the International Ascites Club, um, the definition of this is ascites that cannot be mobilized um, and um, you, or you get a recurrence of this despite medical therapy, i.e. sodium restriction, and uh, these patients uh, are compliant with uh, diuretic management. And so we can classify these as diuretic resistant um, and diuretic intractable. And diuretic resistant patients are patients who have a lack of response to sodium 
restriction um, and diuretic therapy. And the intractable patients are patients who get complications uh, related to uh, uh, their therapy. For example, they may get re renal dysfunction, hyponatremia, et cetera, which means that we can't get them to an effective dose. And they tend to be the majority of patients that we tend to see. Refractory ascites, again, has a poor prognosis, occurs in about 10% of patients with cirrhosis, and uh, median survival of about six months. And we manage these with uh, recurrent LVPs, and again, refer these for transplant. TIPS is the thing that often will come up and, uh, in these patients, and it's associated with improved survival um, and improvement in control of ascites. It decompresses the portal system, so you're basically placing a shunt across the liver between the portal system uh, and the, uh, the, hepatic, uh, the venous system, the systemic circulation. And short-term, it, it, it can accentuate your peripheral arterial vasodilation, but really within four to six weeks, one starts an improvement in circulating volume um, and renal function, and you see an increase in sodium excretion as well. Um, the thing that often comes up is how do I manage diuretics in these patients? Typically, uh, especially early on, one would have to continue uh, diuretic therapy. We will dose, watch them closely and dose adjust, um, and uh, they continue to remain on a sodium restriction. Um, and um, in patients who have ascites where we tip them, we can get resolution about up to 70% of patients, um, which so they can do well. The other complication, and this is a really sort of clinically significant complication with a really poor quality of life for patients, is um, a hepatic, patients who present with hepatic hydrothorax. Occurs in about 5 to 10% of patients with cirrhosis. The majority tend to be right-sided um, compared to the left side. Um, and again, they may have an elevated pleural albumin um, and um, serum albumin gradient. Um, we don't use this that much because especially if, uh, d depending on the resorptor capacity, if they've had infections, et cetera, this gradient can be inaccurate. Um, and these patients have a really high mortality, so up to about 75% at three months. So it's really, really important that we manage these patients aggressively. They can develop bacterial empyema. Unlike SBP, um, where the cutoff is 250 um, cells, um, here it's 500, um, and um, or a positive culture. And we can have SBEM or spontaneous, spontaneous bacterial empyema in the absence of SBP. So just because they don't have SBP, one should not assume they don't have um, uh, bacterial empyema. The thing that we often will see is they'll come in with a chest strain, and the problem is they have a spring from the liver where they will continue to produce ascites. So we really try and get these drains out as quickly as possible um, and consider tips in them. The other thing that we see in patients uh, with cirrhosis is obviously bacterial infections, um, and uh, you have an increased risk of infections because of portosystemic shunting, there's gut dysbiosis, there's increased translocation, and cirrhosis-associated immune dysfunction because cirrhotics are functionally immunosuppressed. And the most common thing that we see is spontaneous bacterial peritonitis and the infection of the acidic fluid without any um, intra-abdominal or surgically treatable source. And as I said, the diagnosis is um, uh, when you have greater than 250 uh, polymorphs, um, and this is by diagnostic paracentesis. That's why these patients may be completely asymptomatic, but it's really, really important to screen them and actually test for uh, SBP. Um, all patients who have ascites are at risk, and the degree of ascites correlates with the degree of risk. Um, and we see this in up to 10% of hospitalized patients. Nowadays, we think about mortality uh, as about 20%. It used to be significantly higher in the past. And how do we treat these patients? We give antibiotics for five to seven days. And the dogma has always been that we give a third generation cephalosporin um, in these patients. But what we're seeing is increased resistance patterns um, um, in patients and uh, changing, um, changing in terms of changes in terms of the types of uh, uh, bacteria that we see. So we see increased MDR um, um, infections in our patient population. So typically, what we do in at our institution, if they have community-acquired SBP, uh, we may start off with a third-generation cephalosporin, but they've been in and out of hospital. We have um, a low threshold to escalate therapy, um, and um, we are on the lookout for MDR-resistant uh, organisms because we obviously will see ESBL, E. coli, et cetera, as well, and we'll have a relatively low threshold to escalate if they're not improving. And the other thing with treatment is uh, IV albumin, and this, uh, we, 
you know, the study was done uh, a number of years ago um, for patients with type 1 hepatic renal syndrome. You have decreased uh, mortality um, as well as improved renal function. And essentially, we give 1.5 grams per kilogram on day one uh, and one gram per kilogram on day three. And typically, we we'll, may do follow-up paracentesis after initiation of therapy. We typically will do this if the patient is not improving. If the initial cell counts were really, really high and we're concerned, or they're clinical, or they, or they have worse um, uh, clinical symptoms and we're worried about failure of therapy. And so when we think about prophylaxis of SBP, um, how do, what, when do we give it? And really, so we divide it into primary and secondary prophylaxis. So primary prophylaxis is when the uh, total protein is, uh, uh, is less than 1.5 and the patient is a uh, child's risk score of uh, nine or greater, or they have a bilirubin of three or greater. And then, or if with their kidney function, their creatinine is greater than or equal to 1.2, their BUN is greater than or equal to 25, or they have a serum sodium of less than 120, 120 well, 130, I beg your pardon. And then patients with secondary prophylaxis is essentially anyone who's had a history of SBP because the cumulative risk of recurrence is about 70% at one year. And if we give prophylaxis, we reduce that risk uh, to about uh, 20 percent. Um, in the U.S., we tend to use ciprofloxacin. Uh, norfloxacin is used in Europe. And then second or third line therapies would be things like uh, Bactrim um, and Cephpodoxine. And the important part is to stop uh, the PPIs in these patients. The next thing we'll go on to is talking uh, about varices um, and screening and surveillance of varices in cirrhosis. So on the top left-hand side, you'll see um, the uh, yellow uh, box and this is the first thing to think about. Patients who have had elastography and have a platelet count of greater than 150, and uh, by elastography, um, they have their score is uh, less than 20 kilopascals, then they are clinically not very likely to have um, high risk uh, varices. So it's less than 5% in this patient population. And so we, do, we don't have to screen these patients. So no need for screening EGD in these patients. Then we'll move on and at the top, uh, what you'll see is high risk patients. So if we see patients who wear the, on elastography, their liver stiffness is greater than 20 kilopascals and they have thrombocytopenia, those are the patients um, that we will uh, then start to screen. And for the purposes, when we think about Charles A, Charles B, or Charles C, we think about Charles A as really compensated cirrhotics and Charles B and C as decompensated cirrhotics. And so there's a nice algorithm to follow. The addition here is it's important to consider whether patients have active or inactive liver disease. So if someone has a history of alcohol use, they're continuing to drink alcohol, or if someone has uh, had hepatitis C, which has, for example, been treated. So if we look at patients with small varices, who's a child's A cirrhotic, if they have active liver disease, you would survey them again in one year. If they don't have active liver disease, you would uh, go to surveillance in two years. So the idea is that um, you actually, we, instead of, sort of we actually try and follow this algorithm and think through each patient and try and come up with how they should be um, surveyed. In the same way as, um, as for example, on the very left-hand side, any page, uh, patient with child C varices, um, you have primary prophylaxis either with non-selective beta blocker or endoscopic variceal ligation. And once they're on a non-selective beta blocker and you get them to where you want them in terms of parameters with the heart rate between 55 and 60 and systolic blood pressure, um, which is also lowered in these patient populations, then there may be no, um, no, need, no further need uh, for surveillance. If someone has had a variceal hemorrhage right at the bottom, um, then um, you'll initially do an upper endoscopy with follow-up band ligation and every two to six weeks. And these patients should be on a non-selective beta blocker as well. Um, and then initially go to surveillance at three to six months and then um, six to 12 months surveillance in these patients. So what do we do in patients who come in? So we, with an acute variceal hemorrhage, what you're really looking at is start vasoactive drug therapy, give them antibiotic prophylaxis. So vasoactive drug therapy, in the for us still um, means octreotide um, and um, elsewhere in Europe we're really talking about telepressin and hopefully with some of the newer data uh, early stage data from the new telepressin trial it will come to us soon as well um, and um, 
in about a small percentage of patients, especially Charles B or C, who are actively bleeding at the time of endoscopy, you can consider um, early tips. And for secondary prophylaxis, we give non selective beta blockers or endoscopic variceal ligation. non selective beta blockers are still the only class of drugs which is recommended for long-term therapy and portal hypertension because they decrease portal flow and it's therefore useful in patients with clinically significant portal hypertension. The goal is a pulse rate between 55 and 60 or systolic blood pressure greater than or equal to 90 millimeters of mercury. And the idea is that we have three drugs, propanolol, nadolol, and carvedilol. And um, because they're non-selective beta blockers, with the beta-1 activity, you decrease the heart rate and cardiac index. With beta-2, you have unopposed um, alpha-adrenergic vasoconstriction. And then with carvedilol, um, because of ad alpha-1 adrenergic uh, blockade, you actually have a decrease in hepatic resistance. That's important because about with intrahepatic vasoconstriction, you, you can get a 30% reversal in the degree of intrahepatic vasoconstriction that's possible. That's why, for example, the patients who are at higher risk of bleeding are patients who come in who are infected because they have a higher degree of intrahepatic vasoconstriction as well. And I'll wrap up very shortly. The next part is hepatic encephalopathy. It's a potentially reversible neuropsychiatric abnormality in our patients with liver dysfunction or portosystemic shunting. Here I'm really just referring to patients uh, with cirrhosis. And about 30 to 45% of decompensated cirrhotics have hepatic encephalopathy. And there's a risk about a 20% uh, annual risk of development in patients with compensated cirrhotics. Has a really, really poor prognosis. If we look at patients who drop out on the waiting list, hepatic encephalopathy, um, waiting for transplant, hepatic encephalopathy is one of the most important parameters in that patient population and has con confers a, a three-year mortality of up to 75%. And we're all familiar with this. We screen them to make sure for infection, GI bleed, uh, dehydration, uh, and look at medications, and we treat them with lactulose um, and rifaximin. The other thing that will often come up, and we're always asked about, is post-tips risk of encephalopathy. Um, for example, if someone has had refractory ascites, don't have encephalopathy, and we, you, get, you tips them, there's no role for primary prophylaxis. Um, so, um, you know, we don't start patients empirically on lactulose or rifaximin because there's no difference. Um, and new onset, depending, there's been one study uh, which was a randomized control trial at about 33%. Some retrospective studies have shown 40 to 45% uh, risk. And there's no difference uh, if these patients are treated or um, versus placebo. And then the last thing is with proton pump inhibitors, we always say avoid unnecessary proton pump inhibitor use for a number of reasons. Proton pump inhibitors um, may decrease. So if you look at the left-hand side over there, they'll decrease um, the neutrophil burst, the oxidative burst. Um, you also have an increase in gastric pH and you have uh, uh, increased dysbiosis, increased bacterial translocation as well. Um, and they may have some intrahepatic effects as well. The end result is that you have an increased risk of SBP, you have an increased risk of hepatitis, encephalopathy, and you have an increased risk of infection and mortality. And the last part is um, renal dysfunction in cirrhotics is very, very important. Um, there is an, when we think about AKI, it's an increase in your serum creatinine of greater than or equal to 0.3. So it's very, very small increases. We may see if someone goes from 0.6 to 0.9, that's an increase of serum creatinine of only 0.3 milligrams uh, per deciliter, um, and or an increase in serum creatinine of greater than 50, uh, greater than or equal to 50 percent in the last three in the last week. And so we classify them, and I put the classifications there for you, but really it's that initial AKI that we really need to watch out for. How do we monitor these patients? If you look on, on the left-hand side in red, you withdraw diuretics, we volume expand them with albumin for 48 hours and watch their response, um, and then try and specifically uh, treat this patient, these patients, and we remove any vasoactive agents uh, and um, any um, agents, um, nephrotoxic agents as well. It can be very hard to differentiate hepatorenal uh, syndrome AKI, HRS AKI from ATN, because you can get all sorts of dysfunction. You get prerenal dysfunction, you can get HRS, you can get ATN, postrenal uh, complications as well. Um, and the key is to try and differentiate hepatorenal syndrome from AKI. And the way we do it is 
Hepatoidal syndrome, AKI, or type 1 HRS, occurs in cirrhotics with ascites classically. And we follow the AKI classifications that I just talked about from the International Club of Ascites. And these patients don't respond to 48 hours of albumin expansion um, at a, a, a gram per kilogram. There's an absence of shock in these patients, and we get rid of any nephrotoxic agents. And there's no evidence of macroscopic um, um, signs of injury. Um, i.e. no proteinuria, no significant hematuria, and the kidney looks normal. Um, and really the treatment options for us in the US are, you know, we give um, albumin, midodrine, and octreotide, or norepinephrine in the ICU, and we're trying to increase the MAPs um, by at least 10 milliliters of mercury. And in Europe, they use albumin atolopressin, and we uh, typically will not use um, um, tips in these patients because they tend to be sick. And the last part is acute on chronic liver failure, which is a frequent occurrence in our patients with cirrhosis. Um, about 30% of admitted patients will have ACLF um, and occurs in about 25% of outpatients. It's a major cause of death in patients with cirrhosis with a 50% mortality rate and develops on a background of decompensation. I won't get into the con controversies about the definition of um, ACLF because a puzzle has a different definition, um, but really for our purposes, it's a patients with decompensated cirrhosis um, who will then um, have uh, further um, worsening um, in their function. Um, and these precipitating events can vary. The most important thing is bacterial infections in about 30 to 60% of cases, alcohol use, so acute alcohol, for patients who present with severe acute alcoholic hepatitis, reactivation of um, Hep B or superimposed um, infections. And just when we look at the pathophysiology, this is a really nice paper from the New England Journal that came out last year. What really we're looking at is this puro classification. You have a um, you have a background, a predisposed condition. You then have some type of injury and then a response and then organ dysfunction. So you have a precipitating event, event such as an infection. You have inflammation induced such as lipolysaccharide, which is pathogen-associated molecular patterns, severe inflammation, immune-mediated tissue damage, um, and then you can develop organ failure. And the number of organ failures are really related to how patients will do. So Europe has the Cliff sofa score. Um, in the U.S., um, Naxold um, uh, came up with the Naxold ACLF score where you have more than two or more extrahepatic organ failures. If you have respiratory dysfunction, if you're BiPAP or ventilator, renal dysfunction, um, circulatory dysfunction, or neurological dysfunction or development of encephalopathy. And the greater the number of organ failures you have, the worse the outcome in this patient population. And that's really the thing to remember. The more the organ, greater the organ failure. So you at the start, even if patients who present may not have had their liver disease may not have been that advanced, if they develop increased numbers of organ failures, they tend to do worse. There's no specific therapy, and it's really um, um, we're really supportively managing these patients. There are pulmonary complications, but in the interest of time, and I know I'm already over time, we will not talk about those today. But overall, when we think about decompensation and to prevent progression in patients, we're really trying to suppress etiologic factors, so stop alcohol if they have hep C, treat hepatitis C, and targeting key factors in pathogenesis. So we target patients for portal, for portal hypertension, so we put them on non-selective beta blockers. If they've got abrogated circulatory dysfunction, we, put, we may give them albumin, et cetera, for example, if they present with SBP. The impact can be variable. It depends on the status of the liver disease at the time of presentation. And so that's why we really have to be aggressive right from the offset in terms of how we manage these patients and follow them through the course of um, their disease. Um, and the one thing that I would say from us, uh, for us as uh, when we see patients in the transplant clinic is, as soon as they have any form of decompensation, we would rather see them early rather than late because it helps us to manage um, manage some of these complications early. With that, I know I'm over time. I apologize. I'll wrap up. Thank you. Thanks so much, RG, for covering a really complicated subject, and I know in a compressed period of time. Um, and then, Dr. Shalom? Yes. Now, our next speaker is Dr. Steven Gonzalez, and he moves from Arkansas to New York, and then finally in Dallas. And he is not a radiologist, and he's a transplant hepatologist and medical director and Baylor Scott & White, Fort Worth. He was going to teach us about IR uh, liver interventions, what we need from a hepatology perspective. With that, Steve, please. Thank you very much for the introduction. 
And uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you to the organizers for the invitation, the opportunity. Special thanks to Dr. Mufti for that fantastic review of portal hypertension. You're going to make my, my job a lot easier. So, um, but we're going to discuss IR liver interventions in hepatology and what you need to know. As we can all acknowledge, uh, patients with uh, cirrhosis and clinical decompensation can present some very challenging uh, scenarios um, from a clinical standpoint. Um, my job this morning is to walk you through some of those clinical presentations, and we'll review some management options uh, from an interventional radiology perspective, some updates, some new innovations, um, and part of this is going to be uh, case-based, so you can start thinking about um, cases that you've experienced before or um, thinking ahead uh, how you'll respond to challenging uh, presentations. Let's see here. Oh, there we go. So uh, Dr. Mufti reviewed portal hypertension that's defined by hepatic venous pressure gradient measurement. And this is more a visual um, uh, uh, sort of uh, way of looking at it. And in, in the perspective from radiology, um, how, do they, how do they do this? Um, and so it's through a transjugular approach. Um, they insert a catheter, uh, goes down to the hepatic veins. Um, they take a pressure measurement, they inflate a balloon, and the pressure in that balloon, the wedge pressure, corresponds with the sinusoidal pressure, okay? And by taking those measurements, we can calculate the hepatic venous pressure gradient, um, which is the difference between that free hepatic vein pressure and the wedged hepatic vein pressure. That pressure then defines portal hypertension, if it's greater than five. Um, and then as Dr. Mufti reviewed that we have classifications here in terms of clinically significant portal hypertension and, for example, uh, a gradient over 12 represents a high risk of variceal hemorrhage. Um, he also reviewed this. I'm not going to go into too much detail. Again, um, just sort of the advantage of, of having this information is you can then, um, number one, define whether portal hypertension uh, exists, but also you can classify different types of portal hypertension. Um, and what's, what's very helpful um, is even in cases where you may have a patient where you're trying to differentiate between um, heart failure and cardiogenic ascites versus underlying uh, cirrhosis, you can see here just by looking at the free hepatic vein pressure and wedge pressure that they would be elevated in both scenarios without a hepatic venous pressure gradient in a person who presents with cardiogenic ascites. Just to point that out as an example of how you can use this um, even in cases that don't really have portal hypertension but present in a way that makes you think they, they could have. But what is clinically significant portal hypertension? Um, so we already defined uh, a gradient greater than five represents portal hypertension. Um, but once that gradient is greater than or equal to 10, then that represents clinically significant portal hypertension. That's where the risk of developing varices, hepatic encephalopathy, and ascites increases. And in that scenario, you can sort of differentiate what the focus is from with gradients less than 10, you're, you're focusing on preventing clinically significant portal hypertension, preventing decompensation. Um, uh, stopping alcohol use, uh, treating viral hepatitis, for example. Those are things where you may have an impact here and primary prophylaxis. Once a person moves into clinically significant portal hypertension, especially if they start to develop uh, complications, then your focus shifts to secondary prophylaxis. A gradient greater than or equal to 12 represents a high risk of variceal hemorrhage, and I'll talk about that in a little more detail in a moment. Um, greater than 16, uh, variceal rebleeding and increased risk of death. Over 20, um, the inability to control variceal hemorrhage. And again, increased mortality, greater than 30, a high risk of SBP. And so there, there's been a lot of literature over the years sort of showing how um, understanding the degree of portal hypertension based on the hepatic venous pressure gradient it actually is associated with um, events and risk in patients with decompensated cirrhosis. Uh, 
In a seminal study by Garcia Sal, this was many years ago, they had a cohort of 93 patients um, who presented with cirrhosis. 49 of them had variceal hemorrhage, 44 didn't, and they did hepatic venous pressure gradient measurements on all of those patients. And what's really remarkable here is you see that there's not a single patient who presented with variceal hemorrhage that had a hepatic venous pressure gradient that was less than 12. And in a follow-up study um, in, uh, in, a, in a cohort um, of almost 1,000 patients, it demonstrated that reduction of hepatic venous pressure gradient has a significant impact in decreasing the uh, pooled odds ratio of bleeding and mortality. So that brings us to tips, because when we think about um, what I just showed you in terms of that in the setting of variceal hemorrhage and that no patients had a gradient less than 12, you can imagine achieving a gradient less than 12 becomes a target uh, if you are trying to reduce that portal hypertension in an acute setting. Um, for a, a transjugular intrahepatic portal systemic shunt, tips, um, there's a visual here. You can look at the fluoroscopy. You can actually envision the outline of the liver here. Um, you can see the hepatic vein, the portal vein. Look how large the portal vein is in the setting of portal hypertension, significantly enlarged there. And there's the tips. There's the shunt um, going across there. Um, a tips is very effective in reducing the portal hypertension. Um, the goal, again, is to reduce the hepatic venous pressure gradient. Indications, variceal hemorrhage. We talked about the target of, of achieving a gradient less than 12. Recurrent ascites, hepatic hydrothorax, bud curare. Those are some examples. Contraindications, heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. You can imagine in a scenario where you're increasing that inflow to the heart, you can really exacerbate right-sided heart failure if that exists. So um, important to check an echocardiogram um, in these patients before undergoing a TIPS. Um, uncontrolled infection, refractory hepatic encephalopathy. Um, this may increase, of course, hepatic encephalopathy. You're increasing uh, portal systemic shunting. Risks, uh, there is a potential for TIPS failure with thrombosis or stenosis, um, hepatic encephalopathy, we mentioned liver failure, mortality, um, and I'll get to uh, the MELT score in a moment. Um, and along with echocardiogram, important to obtain cross-sectional imaging, and that's helpful for our, our radiology colleagues to understand um, the anatomy um, and, and what their targets will be in uh, uh, placing the tips. So patient selection is very important here. In terms of timing, um, there's a potential role for early tips. Um, this was a study um, uh, that was published now, it's over 10 years ago. It was a prospective randomized controlled trial of early tips versus um, endoscopic therapy with non-selective beta blocker therapy in patients who had uh, advanced um, cirrhosis determined by child's BNC classification. They had active bleeding and endoscopy. They underwent a TIPS within the first 72 hours. And what it showed was there was uh, a significant uh, improvement in avoiding rebleeding um, and survival. So it's something to consider um, when you have patients uh, who present um, with bleeding that there may be a role for early TIPS. So that's where we get to outcomes and the MELD score. So, so the MELD score was actually developed to predict post-TIPS mortality. Now, now we use the MELD score, of course, for organ allocation in transplantation. If you think about it, uh, actually the initial studies um, uh, that came out looking at MELD score predicting post-TIPS mortality were over 20 years ago. And um, historical predictors of increased risk post-TIPS, of course, an elevated MELD score. You can see um, the, uh, the graph there that was from a retrospective study, and, and you can see how well um, you can uh, demarcate the difference in survival outcomes post-TIPS based on categories of MELD score. Um, other risk factors um, that have been identified in literature, age over 70, bilirubin greater than three, 
But when you think about what's happened over the last 20 years, okay, there, there have been a lot of differences in how in our interventional radiology colleagues, um, their techniques in, in placing tips, the technology has, has improved. Um, there's variations in indications for tips, some things that weren't necessarily accounted for in early studies, um, recent advances that have come about may actually influence outcomes. For example, uh, in the early days, it was bare metal stents. Now we have covered um, stent grafts. Um, the, we use controlled expansion and individualize um, the tips based on the hepatic venous pressure gradient to achieve that target. Um, and we have a greater attention to comorbidities. And I, I would say we're probably better at patient selection now than we were historically. So there are actually some efforts um, right now um, in terms of de determining a more precise assessment of what are TIPS outcomes. And there's a group called the Advancing Liver Therapeutic Approaches Group, ALTA, um, and it's a consensus study group. Um, and they are currently evaluating practice-based recommendations for TIPS. They're focusing on candidate selection, management outcomes. Um, and this is hot off the press um, in the Red Journal. Um, and looking at, uh, this is a multi-center retrospective study of over a thousand patients. So looking at TIPS outcomes in the current era. And what they found is um, looking at, in terms of indications for TIPS, if you look at between patients who underwent TIPS for variceal hemorrhage versus ascites and hepatic hydrothorax, there was no difference in survival over time. However, the patients with um, ascites and hepatic hydrothorax were more likely to undergo transplantation. And importantly, if you look at the, um, at the, at the figures on the right-hand side, um, when you look at what, uh, by MELD score, you can see a trend towards increased hazard ratio, hazard of death, post-tips um, in the ascites hepatic encephalopathy group, but it doesn't reach statistical significance. But in those with variceal hemorrhage, you can see a cutoff emerge at uh, MELD score greater than 20. So I, I think we're going to see a lot more out of this group in terms of really defining um, uh, TIPS outcomes and post-TIPS um, uh, mortality. And this is going to translate into selecting TIPS candidates in the current era. What about post-TIPS hepatic encephalopathy? Um, there are several established risk factors for post-TIPS hepatic encephalopathy, um, including prior encephalopathy, of course, um, child's class, elevated meld, age, creatinine, hyponatremia, sarcopenia. And to address this, there was one study out of France looking at, and this was just recently published um, uh, this year in the Annals of Internal Medicine, uh, looking at rifaximin versus placebo. Um, they treated uh, patients 14 days pre-tips and then six and all the way through six months post-tips. They looked at outcomes. Um, just as a disclaimer, there were 86% of these were alcohol-related liver disease. They had a MELD score around 12. So um, you have to consider sort of the population may be different than uh, the populations uh, uh, and if we generalize uh, to a larger scale. But they found there's a decrease in overt hepatic encephalopathy in the rifaximin group, 34%. Um, versus 53%. Dr. Mufti actually pointed out that um, at a baseline, based on prior studies, the incidence of new onset hepatic encephalopathy post-TIPS is somewhere in that 30 to 40% range. Here, it was 50, over 50%. So again, it just, just to take that with a grain of salt, but that's, um, that's one study that has um, looked at that prospectively. So let's shift gears. I want to present a case to you. This is a real case. This is a challenging scenario. This is a case of a portal vein thrombosis and gastric variceal bleed. It's a 51-year-old woman with hep C cirrhosis uh, with a history of, of hepatic encephalopathy and ascites, MELD score 16. She presented with acute variceal bleed. Uh, bleed. Um, she had profound hematemesis, hemorrhagic shock, required packed red cells, um, a TIPS placement was attempted at an outside hospital, but they were not able to do it. And when you look at the CT scan, she had a portal vein thrombosis with cavernous transformation. And that's the upper figure there. Um, when you see cavernous transformation, that represents a chronic portal vein thrombosis and um, essentially a loss of what was the portal vein uh, 
when you look at the imaging here. Um, and uh, you can see the dilated splenic vein with the spleno-renal shunt. And um, I don't have a pointer here, but if you look at the bottom figure, you can see that shunt right where the arrow is. That's the left renal vein. Um, and there's a shunt that communicates with uh, the splenic vein. And if you go uh, upwards, you can see those are massive gastric varices. Um, so this is a scary situation. What do we do here? Well, a decision was to proceed with the balloon retrograde transvenous occlusion, BRTO, of the gastric varices. It's a reasonable thought considering the anatomy, um, considering the acuity of the presentation. Something had to be done urgently. And with the cavernous transformation, that re represents a real challenge in just placing a TIPS uh, real quickly. As far as portal vein thrombosis, as in this case, um, that can present acutely. And in, in the acute setting, um, uh, in many cases, it, uh, a patient can present with symptoms. Uh, there may be a role for anticoagulation based on your comfort in terms of their uh, bleeding risk. Um, and in some cases, they may actually spontaneously recantalize on follow-up. In chronic, um, there's a, a collateral circulation dominates um, the, the shunting um, that occurs. And um, in, in, in this case, there, there is no role for anticoagulation. And uh, you can see sort of a better figure here um, on the side where you see once was the um, portal vein is now um, just a whole con conglomeration of, of uh, collaterals. Um, the incidence of portal vein thrombosis in patients with cirrhosis is um, in the 10 to 15% per year range. Remember, cavernous transformation, when you see that on the radiology report, that indicates chronicity. Um, there has been some literature uh, looking at how this can impact disease progression, although um, it's, it's mixed as far as what's been uh, 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 documented in studies, but certainly it creates a challenge in terms of management, especially uh, when we're considering TIPS. So this patient underwent a BRTO, and, and what exactly is that? So uh, up to 80% of gastric varices are associated with a left-sided portosystemic shunt, usually in the form of a spleno-renal shunt, um, which I showed to you. So if you look at the diagram here, um, and again, unfortunately, I don't have a pointer, but um, the, the, the inflow that feeds um, the gastric varices is coming from that splenic vein. And, and then that then moves down through this shunt the, to the uh, left renal vein in that example. So what can, what can be done is, is achieve a retrograde access um, through the systemic veins, um, and which is essentially the outflow of, of this, um, uh, uh, of the shunt. And by isolating that, uh, they can achieve stasis with balloon occlusion and uh, sclerosant. And the balloon is then deflated, it's removed, and uh, after conf confirmation of shunt thrombosis. So you're basically shutting off that entire system. But remember um, that there's this redirects flow to the portal circulation. So this may exacerbate portal hypertension and specifically esophageal varices um, that are fed through alternative collaterals. There's some variations on this and you may hear about some of these and just to kind of keep it straight with the radiologist, um, this can be done through an anterograde access. So basically uh, transhepatic. And so it becomes BATO instead of uh, BRTO uh, for anterograde. They can use coils, so coil assisted CARDO or plug assisted PARDO. So this is just all sort of in the lingo of our radiology colleagues, but just so you know, it's essentially achieving um, the same effect. So we have endoscopic options as well, um, and Dr. Kedia is going to uh, present some of those to us um, later this morning. Um, there was a study, again, this is hot off the press, um, looking at um, BRTO um, versus EGD with cyanoacrylate. Uh, gluing injection. Um, now, BRTO, remember, is effective in preventing re-bleeding, but there's a potential for um, esophageal varices um, in up to a half of patients um, that if there's pre-existing esophageal var varices, they can increase in size in up to a third. In this study, um, this, there were 34% of them who did not have baseline esophageal varices. Band ligation was performed in all patients. They excluded patients with portal vein thrombosis, so very important. And what they found uh, was that uh, BRTO 
actually was more effective in preventing rebleeding from gastric varices or all causes, but there was no difference in survival. So where, where does that leave us? Well, I, I think that leaves us with, um, it's sort of open-ended, and I think you have to think about what are your resources locally, what is the what is the expertise, um, and in thinking about each patient individually. But both are options. So let's get back to our case. So that patient stabilized um, after their BRTO, and then they had an acute decline in their hemoglobin to six within 48 hours. Um, an EGD was performed. There were small esophageal varices, but there is that large gastric varix. Um, that had been um, uh, occluded through the BRTO. Um, just as an additional safety measure, um, it was injected with cyanoacrylate. A Blakemore tube was placed, and then the patient underwent a CT angiogram because we wanted to confirm um, that there was thrombosis. And if you look at that um, image, you can see what where once was that, that splenorenal shunt and those huge splenic varices and the, or, and, and, and the gastric varices, the splenic vein and gastric varices are no longer enhancing. So the Blakemore was removed and the patient was discharged. However, she came back within two weeks with recurrent hematemesis. Again, with a decline in her hemoglobin, MELD is still 16. And now you look at the EGD, what happened? Huge esophageal varices, there's a fibrin plug required band ligation. Looking down at the gastric varix, it's, uh, there's a healing ulcer. That was not the source of bleed. So this is exactly a scenario of what we were just discussing, where after the BRTO, um, especially in the setting of the portal vein thrombosis, now you have this rapid enlargement of esophageal varices. So this patient remained at a very high risk of rebleeding. So what do we do? A transplenic tips. Okay, so um, the radiologists are able to achieve access to the splenic vein percutaneously, so across the spleen into the splenic vein, and what you see here is the splenic vein, uh, venogram, if we're going from left to right. Um, then enhancing further, uh, looking at the portal venogram, what was there was a right portal vein, but above you see the hepatic venogram. There's no connection, okay, because it's Thrombosis. This person had a chronic portal vein thrombosis. So they placed a, uh, they put a micro snare at that right portal vein to create a target. And then they were able to achieve um, access from the hepatic vein to that portal vein. And um, then they did a, a, a portal vein angioplasty and thrombectomy. Oh, thank you. I have a pointer now. Thank you. And in this case, the gradient was reduced from 30 to 7. Okay, so that's a big sigh of relief. And the patient did great, and she's still doing okay today. So what about this um, procedure, the transplenic tips with portal vein recanalization? Um, this, the, the goal of this is to achieve um, recanalization in cases of chronic thrombosis um, and is a way to optimize a patient for candidacy for liver transplant. And this has been pioneered by a group at uh, Northwestern over the last few years. Um, they've published uh, two studies on this. And they've shown uh, success in maintaining TIPS patency, but also importantly, by recanalization of that portal vein, um, the majority of patients who underwent transplant were able to undergo end-to-end -end portal vein anastomosis. So that was very helpful. So in our, in our uh, patients who are potential liver transplant candidates, this allows more um, options in terms of transplant surgery. What about lower GI bleeding? So this is also very challenging um, in terms of rectal varices and hemorrhoidal bleeding. Um, when we think of, yes, there are endoscopic and surgical interventions, but in many cases can be associated with a high risk, depending on where you are, um, you know, our surgical colleagues um, will shy away from this. Um, uh, banding, sclerotherapy, hemorrhoidectomy are options, but there is a high risk of uh, rebleeding. Even with TIPS placement, um, so with TIPS, there's a potential for incomplete hemostasis with rebleeding. In some cases, in some studies, over 40 percent. So in in many cases, uh, embolization can also be done at that time. It's through a transhepatic approach. Remember, the TIPS is placed, so they can go right across 
um, the liver and then find their way down to um, the uh, rectal varices and use uh, gel foam coiling or sclerosant um, to obliterate those. Hemorrhoidal bleeding, a little bit different, and this is something very new um, where coil embolization of the superior hepatic, uh, I'm sorry, hemorrhoidal artery can be um, achieved and reduce arterial inflow and pressure. And I'm sorry, you really can't see, these are called micro coils, I think for a reason, because you can't really see them, but I placed some arrows there. If you look really closely, you can see the little coils that were placed there. So here's a different case, completely different scenario. 62-year-old um, man with alcohol-related cirrhosis, anocytes, low MELD score, but recurrent overt hepatic encephalopathy, multiple hospitalizations. Um, we're working so hard with this patient, having uh, with lactulose, three to five bowel moons daily, rifaximin, standard of care, very compliant, but continued hospitalizations. EGD shows um, small esophageal varices. There's no active or recurrent bleeding associated with this. And when you do an MRI, you see this dilated um, splenic veins. Look at that, that's huge splenic veins and a large splenoretal shunt. If you look at the um, image um, on the right, you can see the kidney and the left renal vein and the splenorenal shunt coming right off of that, going right into the um, uh, splenic veins. So that is a case of spontaneous portosystemic shunting and exacerbation of hepatic encephalopathy. Um, it's important to consider this in your patients who have refractory hepatic encephalopathy to assess for shunts. Um, in, a, in a large retrospective cohort study of over 1,700 patients, the prevalence of large shunts was 28%. The most common version of this is a splenorenal shunt, and the size increases with the MELD score. Um, and the increased size, you can imagine, increased hepatic encephalopathy. Um, and you can see in the figure there that the, um, as the MELD score and the child's classification, classification increases, you have an increased um, uh, prevalence of uh, uh, spontaneous poor systemic shunts. Um, and it's hard to see on, uh, based on the, um, the, the graph there on the side, but to tell you that um, in the patients with lower MELD scores, that there may be an impact in survival and transplant-free survival when a uh, spontaneous poor systemic shunt is present. And when patients do have clinically significant portal hypertension and shunting like this, there is a potential for increased decompensating events. So it's important to screen for this because um, there is a potential role for embolization. Um, and this is similar to um, what we were talking about before as far as the BRTO. Um, this is an example of uh, an inferior mesenteric vein that's communicating uh, with uh, the left renal vein. And you can see after coiling, it's gone, right? So this is, you can consider this in some patients. Um, in patients with an elevated MELD score, so greater than 11, may be less likely to benefit based on studies looking at this. Remember, there's again an increased potential for portal hypertension in terms of worsening ascites or in enlargement of varices. You have to watch out for that. Um, but a majority can have a durable response, and you can imagine then a significant decrease in hospitalizations for uh, their recurrent hepatic encephalopathy. So this is my summary slide, um, just to bring up some key points. Um, the hepatic venous pressure gradient remains a critical tool for um, optimizing interventional radiology interventions in these patients with portal hypertension. Um, it provides a target for those radiologists. It can be a way to risk stratify our patients. Um, in cases of uh, 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 TIPS, BRTO, vascular embolization, these, are, these are, can be very effective in managing acute and chronic uh, presentations and of, of portal hypertension. Remember that there's a potential for redirecting portal hypertension to other locations um, and exacerbating, uh, for example, esophageal varices when we do vascular obstruction or obliteration. And um, evolving techniques um, may influence post-TIPS outcomes. And I think we're going to see more of an individualized approach when you consider local resources, expertise, transplant candidacy, anatomy, um, MELD score. All of these things come into play as far as determining um, what the next step will be in managing these cases. So I encourage you to um, talk to your uh, interventional radiologists, explore what options you have locally, and remember, this is a multidisciplinary approach 
when we're talking about these types of procedures. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. That's a great talk. Thanks so much. Um, and for our final speaker this morning, we welcome um, Nicole Rich, who began her training for medicine in uh, at Ohio State and then made her way to Texas um, for her residency T32 Gastroenterology Fellowship, Transplant Hepatology Fellowship, and is currently part of our research group doing hepatocellular carcinoma research. And she's going to speak to us about um, HCC update. Uh, great. Thank you. Um, so much. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for the kind introduction. And I'd like to thank the organizers, Chuck and Lisa, for the invitation to speak to you today. I will be giving you an update on the diagnosis and treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma. You might wonder why is this in the session? Um, and I can hope I can impress upon you um, the importance of HCC and the role of gastroenterologists and hepatologists in its management. Uh, here are my disclosures. So I'm going to begin my talk by discussing the changing epidemiology of HCC and the population that is at risk. We'll then touch on surveillance, diagnosis, and finally treatment advances. So HCC is the third leading cause of cancer-related death worldwide and a leading cause of death in patients with cirrhosis. And as you see here on the map, um, there is geographic disparity in HCC with the highest incidence rates in East Asia particularly Japan, Sub-Saharan Africa, with intermediate incidents in North America. And interestingly, HCC is one of the few cancers in the United States with rising incidence and mortality rates. We've seen great advances, particularly in colorectal cancer, lung cancer, and breast cancer, as you see here on the slide. But HCC is, in fact, the fastest rising cause of cancer-related death currently in the United States. And unfortunately, our own great state of Texas, uh, in fact, has the highest incidence of HCC in the United States. You see here the heat maps um, on your left with the darker red areas indicating um, highest HCC incidence and mortality. Um, you see Texas is just becoming more red over time um, with an incidence rate of 13.2 per 100,000 people, um, followed by Hawaii, New Mexico, and Louisiana. And Texas incidence is in fact 45% higher than the national average, um, particularly in South Texas and the border counties where the incidence and mortality is highest, driven in part by rising incidence in, um, in Latino men. So HCC is typically thought of a highly fatal cancer with poor prognosis, uh, five-year survival of less than 15%. However, it's important to remember that prognosis varies significantly based on stage. And in fact, curative treatments are available for patients with early stage HCC, including resection, uh, particularly for patients without portal hypertension who are not decompensated, um, as well as liver transplantation for those who are decompensated, and local ablation. And so the whole idea behind HCC surveillance is we want to find these patients um, when we're at an early stage so that we can intervene. Who should we surveil? Well, we need to figure out that the risk is high enough in that given population. We need to have effective treatments who are avail that are available for screen detected patients. And finally, just like we see with CRC screening, the best test is the test that gets done and that the patient actually completes. So just to anchor you here, the majority of HCC in the United States occurs in a background of cirrhosis. So unlike um, in Asia, where many cases occur in patients with chronic hepatitis B who do not have cirrhosis, 80 to 90% of cases of HCC have cirrhosis. Um, patients with HCC have cirrhosis in the US. So this is the primary at-risk population, so keep this in mind. And it could be cirrhosis of any cause, as you see here. But what's interesting is, you know, this group is well aware we've made great strides in treating hepatitis C and suppressing hepatitis B. And so the epidemiology of HCC has really changed over the past 10 years. We're now seeing patients in our contemporary practices um, that have cured hepatitis C, suppressed hepatitis B, and now um, many more patients with NAFLD, as Dr. Harrison, you know, impressed upon you. And so we're moving from these established risk factors um, I was looking for the pointer. Um, these established risk factors, oh, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, 
so the established risk factors that we've been seeing, you know, for many years, you can see that the incidence rate for these is quite higher compared to those with cured hepatitis C or hepatitis B. Um, however, uh, this is what's becoming much more common. So what is the evidence supporting HCC surveillance in patients with cirrhosis? Well, the level one data that we have is actually in patients with hepatitis B. This is coming from Asia, two randomized controlled trials in China, um, where they found a 37% reduction in mortality in the patients that received surveillance. However, we have no level one data um, or randomized controlled trial supporting um, HCC surveillance in patients with cirrhosis. And this is important because, again, the epidemiology is so different. Most HCC in the West are happening in patients with cirrhosis. Our patients are older, they have more comorbidities, and further, they have the, therefore the risk that's competing of liver-related mortality. However, the absence of level one evidence is certainly not the absence of any evidence. Um, there is good level two data, as you see here in this meta-analysis of um, over 20 observational cohort studies uh, that found that HCC surveillance was associated with improved early stage detection, curative treatment receipt, and perhaps most importantly, survival. And so based off of this data, the ASLD has recommended, um, and this is the most recent guidelines for HCC from 2018, that all patients with cirrhosis should be screened for HCC. Further, they should receive surveillance uh, using ultrasound with or without AFP every six months. And so this is a table from the guidelines showing you the high risk groups for HCC surveillance. And so many of you will be familiar with this table. The key thing to keep in mind is any patient with cirrhosis of any cause. Although of course the incidence is highest in patients with chronic hepatitis C, particularly active hep C, and lower in those with autoimmune hepatitis, all of these should be screened. This includes, one thing if you can take away, includes patients um, who are post SVR. Uh, and we'll discuss that further on the next few slides as well as those with uh, viral suppression of their hepatitis B. So this was a study from the VA uh, system of over 22,000 veterans who were treated with DAAs. They achieved hep C cure, SVR. Um, and as you can see here, I think the really striking thing is the blue line represents patients who have achieved cure. The red line is those who have not. Um, you can see that, of course, the patients that achieved cure had a much lower incidence of HCC. However, you can see there that blue line stays at about 1.5% over 20 months. It does not go back to zero. And so these patients are still meeting that threshold um, of the cost effectiveness for HCC screening, which is when the incidence is over 1.5% per year. Um, so these patients, they need to be uh, continue to survey, be surveilled for HCC even after they've achieved SVR. Now, what complicates things further, of course, this is never cut and dry. The HCC risk really varies among these patients. And so um, there's many, a lot, there's a lot of uh, attention being paid to creating risk scores, risk calculators, to try to determine which patients are at highest risk after they've been treated. Of course, some of the typical variables have been falling out, age, platelet count, AST-LT ratio, albumin, which you would recognize from the APRI score or FIB4 score. Um, but it's important to keep in mind what I have bolded at the bottom, that the three-year risk in cirrhosis patients with SVR, still over 1.5%, but it may be as high as over 10%. So um, these patients are still at significant risk. One of the things that's been proposed is maybe we could use the Delta Fib4 to improve our prediction of HCC risk. So we know that after patients are treated for their hep C, they have some improvement in fibrosis, um, portal hypertension, and certainly their Fib4 may change. And so this was a recent study showing that this Delta Fib4, so patients that had improvement in their Fib4 down to less than 3.25 are at lower risk of HCC. Although again, you see here, it's still over that 1.5% per year risk cutoff. So again, these patients all need to be screened if they have had cirrhosis in the past. So switching gears to kind of the new frontier and the new challenge of HCC surveillance, as again, as Dr. Harrison impressed upon you, the, the I don't even know if it's appropriate to say the rising tide of NAFL that's already risen. Um, this is the global prevalence of NAFL. Do you see here one in uh, four patients in the United States has NAFL um, and really throughout the world with highest prevalence in Middle East and South America. 
And this is really a challenge for us because if you think about it, one in four patients have NAFLD. Um, we know that these patients are at risk. However, they're most at risk if they have cirrhosis. So this was another study from the VA system where they had over nearly 300,000 patients with NAFLD. They compared them to matched controls and they found that, as you see in this graph, the darker line, the patients with NAFLD had a much higher incidence of HCC compared to controls. However, if you really zoom in, you look at the, the y-axis here, these are really small numbers, 2.2 um, uh, per 1,000 patients, so patient years, so pretty low. And in fact, when the authors compared this to patients with NAFLD cirrhosis, you can see here that the incidence is much higher than just those patients with NAFLD. So again, this is really the group we need to focus on are those with cirrhosis and not just those with some degree of fibrosis. Now, complicating this issue, we've all seen in our practices, these patients who have NASH, they don't have cirrhosis, and they pop up with an HCC. And this, in fact, it can occur in 20 to 30% of patients with NASH. And so this is the real challenge of how can we identify those patients without feeling like we need to screen the entire 25% uh, of the population in the US with NASH. So to summarize, these are the groups in whom HCC surveillance really remain uncertain. Um, patients with NASH without cirrhosis and those with hepatitis C who do not have cirrhosis, who have stage three fibrosis. So the backbone, the backbone of HCC surveillance is ultrasound. Um, the problem with ultrasound, it's operator dependent. Um, it is cheap, it's easily accessible, but this was a study we did at UT Southwestern in Parkland where we found one in five ultrasounds were in fact of inadequate quality, um, with only two thirds being definitely adequate. So this is a real problem. And if you look at the factors that we found that were associated with inadequate ultrasound, these are men, patients with more advanced cirrhosis, they have a more nodular liver, they're obese. So BMI over 35 was associated with a six to eight times higher odds of having an inadequate ultrasound. And then patients who have NASH or ASH. So the liver gets steatotic and the ultrasound is just not as sensitive. So this is the population that we're gonna be seeing and, and ultrasound is just not gonna cut it alone. So many of you are also familiar with AFP, um, a serum test. It is not sufficient as a surveillance test when it's used alone due to inadequate sensitivity and specificity. And this is a little bit of a, a, a kind of a, a, I'm not sure how well known this is, but the AFP in fact is normal in up to 30% of patients with HCC. So if you see a liver mass and the AFP is normal, you can't rule that out. Um, the problem is um, AFP is also elevated in patients who have uh, hepatitis C with active viremia, other chronic liver diseases. Um, the cutoff that we use is 20, although the delta AFP can al also be useful. So in my practice, if I see a patient with an AFP rise from 6 to 11, although it's less than 20, I will still go ahead and order their cross-sectional imaging. Um, this was another study uh, meta-analysis that showed that the sensitivity of ultrasound by adding AFP improves from 45% to 63%. So that is why the ASLD guidelines now recommend ultrasound with or without AFP. So the exciting thing about HCC surveillance, I just talked to you about how inadequate ultrasound is. There's a lot of exciting things on the horizon and I won't belabor all of these here so that we can talk about HCC treatment. Um, but blood-based biomarkers are really gonna be the way of the future, particularly GALID, which incorporates AFP in addition to AFPL3 and DCP to other serum biomarkers with gender and age. And it really has um, great accuracy. Um, also EMR-based risk stratification tools. We're using radiomics, abbreviated MRI. There's a lot of excitement um, in the, the world of HCC surveillance. So much more to come on that front. Now, many of you will be familiar with the LIRADS. I'm switching gears here to diagnosis. Um, this is really the standard for reporting of liver masses. Um, it's used by radiologists, and so keep in mind, um, HCC is one of the few cancers that we can make a non-invasive diagnosis based off of its classic radiographic features, which really um, leverage the, uh, the dual blood supply of the liver. So the classic features are arterial phase hyperenhancement, um, washout on the delayed phase, enhancing capsule, and then of course threshold growth. And you don't need to know the chart on the left. This is what radiologists use to assign it this LIRAD score that we're also familiar with. Um, and you see here on the right, this score ranges from one, which is definitely benign, to five, which is definitely HCC. How accurate is the LIRADS? Well, 
Lyrads, this was a, a meta-analysis recently published in Gastro of over 2,400 patients with HCC. If you have a Lyrads 5 lesion, you can be very confident that is HCC. Um, that has a 95% accuracy. Um, the real challenge comes in patients with Lyrads 4 lesions, um, in which 75% of those are HCC, and Lyrads M lesions, in which almost all of them are malignant, about a third are HCC that are, have an atypical appearance. And so this really complicates the management. And this is an often dilemma we get, a referral we get of how do we manage these different lesions. Um, of course, one and two are pretty easy. You're just going to put the patient back to their surveillance that they would have been getting every six months. Lyrads three lesions, I will typically do a short-term follow-up imaging in three to six months. Say you had a CT the first time. These are indeterminate lesions. You could consider getting an MR for the next scan. But what I wanted to focus on was the management of LR4 lesions and LRM lesions, which we've all seen. And these really represent the diagnostic kind of dilemma. So for Lyrads 4 lesions, um, we recommend biopsying them if they're over two centimeters in size, because again, the positive predictive value for HCC is much higher in that case. The key thing to keep in mind, um, certainly at some centers, they would treat an LR4 lesion, but if you think that patient is a transplant candidate in any way, shape, or form, you need to biopsy that lesion prior to treating it because UNOS will not grant meld exception points for patients with LR4 lesions. So it's really important that if you want to ablate it, have your radiologist uh, IR biopsy it at time of ablation. For LRM lesions, um, these are also tricky. Of course, we're pretty sure that these are malignant, 90% plus. Um, but oftentimes they're non-HCC malignancies, such as cholangiocarcinoma, mixed tumors, and other metastatic disease. Again, if you think this patient is a transplant candidate, needs to be biopsied. Um, not only will it change management for that patient, um, but also we need to know um, if, if those are not HCC because then transplant would not be indicated. But similarly, about a third of these patients indeed are HCC, and so you don't want to um, kind of box the patient out from transplant if that's a possibility. So switching gears here um, in the last couple minutes to talk a little bit more about advances in treatment. Um, so there's been significant advances in transplant. So classically for HCC, we transplanted patients who were within the Milan criteria, which is one lesion less than five, um, up to three lesions less than three centimeters in size. Now, of course, we're always trying to push the envelope. And so patients who exceed the Milan criteria, no macrovascular invasion, um, who are otherwise potential transplant candidates really should undergo aggressive um, attempts at downstaging. And this is because they are now, just over the past couple years, eligible for MELD exception points from UNOS. So we can get these patients transplanted um, even with a deceased donor. Of course, you may also want to consider a living donor a transplant in this population. And so this is why early referral to a transplant center is critical, even if that patient is just outside Milan. Um, you see the inclusion criteria for downstaging uh, there on the left in the box. This, um, for those of you who have seen the literature, this was the UCSF criteria, which has now been widely adopted by UNOS. Um, certainly, as you saw here, this is the study from UCSF. Some of these patients will drop out of the wait list. Certainly, they will not all um, be able to be downstaged with local regional therapy. But among those who are, they have a 78% five-year survival, which is really equivalent to patients um, transplanted within Milan. Of course, in transplant, you know, our surgeons were always trying to push it more and more and more. Um, so, of course, now there's even more expanded criteria for transplant. Um, the Toronto group is really leading the way on this, where they're transplanting folks with any size or number of tumors. Um, the, the reason or the way that they're kind of um, stratifying their risk is they're biopsying all these tumors. And if they're poorly differentiated, they cannot go to transplant. Um, of course, if they have extrahepatic disease, not transplanted. But again, you can see here on the right, 72% five-year overall survival. So transplant, the, the net is really becoming wider and wider for these patients, which is really their definitive therapy. Um, of course, as Dr. Gonzalez pointed out, there's been a lot of advances um, from the IR groups um, in terms of local regional therapy. We know that TACE, they've had a, a lot of experience with TACE over the last 10 years, um, and as well as Y90, which you can see here on the right. This is a large tumor in the right lobe that was treated with Y90 with an almost complete response, as you see in the bottom right of the screen after six months. But perhaps most exciting is the rapidly evolving treatment landscape for advanced HCC. And so many of you are familiar with serafinib, um, which came about as um, after the SHARP trial in 2008. 
Serafinib, as many of us know, is not a be-all end-all. So it improved median overall survival from eight months to 11 months in patients with advanced HCC. Um, we then had a slew of negative trials over the next 10 years um, until May of 2020. Um, and this is just a table, before I get to the, the new advance, this is a table showing really these incremental improvements in survival from the SHARP, REFLECT, resource trial, both in the first and second line setting. Many of you will be familiar with these drugs, serafinib, lenvatinib, regorafinib. None of these really had great improvement compared to placebo. And then along came the immune checkpoint inhibitors, which have had great success in other cancers. And so people thought, well, why not in HCC? And so the main ones we're, we'll be discussing, um, the anti-PD-1 inhibitors, nivolumab, pembrolizumab, um, and then uh, the, the one I'll be discussing on the next slide is an anti-PD-L1, atezolizumab, um, and there's others certainly under current investigation, Durva, um, Durva and Tremi. So this was the pivotal um, study in the New England Journal of Medicine published in May of 2020. This was a phase three global open label study of atezolizumab, anti pdl one plus bevacizumab, which you may recognize as a Vastin um, or an anti-VEGF um, versus serafinib in the first line for patients with advanced unresectable HCC. So these are patients with either tumor thrombus or um, extra hepatic disease. And as you see at this Kaplan-Meier curve here on the left, the Atizo Bev arm in blue um, outperforms serafinib with hazard ratio of 0.58 for survival. Um, and you see that at 17 months, atezobev had not reached its median overall survival. These patients were still alive, um, whereas the median overall survival for serafinib was just 13 months. And I think one of the most exciting things you see there in the red box is that the objective response rates were 27%. And in fact, 5% of these patients in the trial actually had complete response or cure of their HCC. And again, these are patients with advanced tumors. And this, um, here are the AEs compared to serafinib. It was really well tolerated. There was a similar uh, prevalence of grade three to five AEs. One of the most important things for us to realize as gastroenterologists or to take away from this study is that, of course, this being an anti-VEGF, the bevacizumab component is associated with upper GI bleeding, 7% in this study. And so all of these patients um, should have an EGD within six months prior to starting a TZO and BEV. So you will be getting a lot of requests from local oncologists uh, for an EGD uh, for screening. It's not enough for the patient to simply be um, caught up with their variceal screening because, of course, these patients with advanced HCC will often have developed a tumor thrombus or may have worsening portal hypertension, so they must be screened. Um, so to summarize, you know, there's a lot of excitement. Um, these first-line systemic agents with atezobev may even be able to be used in um, more intermediate stages, uh, given their uh, curative effect in some patients. And this is going to be a huge challenge for us also with liver transplantation. So as I mentioned, a proportion of these patients will have partial response or even 5% might be cured. And so in that case, why couldn't they proceed to liver transplant? Um, so we do have limited safety data in the transplant setting. The group at Mount Sinai has published a series of 10 patients in which it appears to be safe. They were treating these patients with nivolumab up until the time of transplant. We do know that the immune modulatory effect of um, IOs lasts longer than the half-life of the medication itself, which is about four weeks for nivolumab. And we really, as a community, need to determine the optimal washout period prior to transplantation. Uh, but there should be much more to come on this in the next couple of years. So to conclude, um, increasing HCC incidence, it really underscores the importance of surveilling your patients and really identifying the most at-risk groups, which now is providing a lot of challenges to us, these patients with hep C who are post-SVR, those with NAFLD. Um, the ASLD guidelines recommend ultrasound plus or minus AFP every six months in patients uh, with cirrhosis. And at this time, we do not uh, ASLD does not recommend screening patients without cirrhosis who have NAFLD or those with F3 fi fibrosis. Um, to take away, I think the biggest thing is that the future is bright for HCC. This is no longer an automatic death sentence. Um, and Atizo and Bev is now the first line standard for advanced HCC. And again, just to highlight, these patients need an EGD uh, within six months prior to starting therapy. Uh, we do need more data, um, optimal sequencing, biomarkers to guide our therapies, and identifying the optimal washout period prior to transplant. And 
as you've seen, this is quite um, rapidly evolving and complicated topic, and it really requires a multidisciplinary team um, of IR, surgery, medical oncology, uh, and hepatologists. And earl early referral to a transplant center is absolutely critical um, to offer the patient all available options. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole, for that really great high yield talk. So we've covered a lot of high yield information that's also really complicated and we're running over. So um, what we'd like to do is have speakers come up. If you have questions, please come up and ask your questions. But otherwise, we're going to take a five minute break before we move on to the next session. <laughs>